Hello everyone, welcome back. Today, we're about to formally enter the section of electrophysiology. In this episode, we're going to talk about the resting membrane potential. This is the first half of the episode about resting membrane potentials. Let's take a look at what we will learn in this episode. First, we're going to talk about cross-membrane transport, especially the different types of transport and different types of proteins utilized in this process. And then we're going to get into some chemistry. We're going to first deduce the Nernst equation and then calculate the equilibrium potential of different ions. In the next episode, we're going to dive deeper and examine the multi-ion case. In this episode, we're going to focus on the case for single ions. The software Metaneuron is recommended for these episodes it is available in the URL at the bottom of the page. In Metaneuron, you can try and verify some of the equations that we've deduced. Or you can even conduct some experiments and try to deduce the equations by yourself. Let's get right to the topic, cross-membrane transport. Why do we need cross-membrane transport? Is this something that's very hard? Well, yes. Actually, this is because of the property of the membrane. The membrane is made of phospholipids. The phospholipid structure is like this. Unlike some lipids like triglycerides, which are all hydrophobic, phospholipids have hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. As we can see in this figure, the head has a phosphate group in it, so it has very high affinity to water. In contrast, the two hydrocarbon tails are made of long hydrocarbon chains and they don't like water, so we call them hydrophobic. The cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. The heads are on either surfaces of the membrane, while the tails are hidden in between. Due to this property, the membrane has an inner hydrophobic region. As a result, molecules that are polar or carry charges find it very hard to pass through the neuronal membrane. And that is why we need cross-membrane transport in general to carry things across. There are three major types of cross-membrane transport. One of them is passive transport, one of them active transport, and the third bulk transport. Passive transport is named passive because it does not consume energy. In other words, it does not require ATP to provide energy for transporting things across the membrane. Passive transport has several subtypes. For example, simple diffusion. This is just what you think. Diffusion. For example, if someone sprays some perfume in one corner of the room, then the odor molecules of the perfume will diffuse in the air in the room, and soon everyone in the room will be able to smell it. This is because molecules have the tendency to diffuse from where it has higher concentration to where it has lower concentration. The difference in concentration is called a concentration gradient. The higher the concentration difference, the higher the gradient. Molecules tend to flow down the concentration gradient, that is to say, from higher concentration to lower concentration. Simple diffusion is just like this. Small molecules such as oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse directly across the membrane. Some small polar molecules like water can also diffuse across the membrane, the hydrophobic region, because they are small enough to pass through. Osmosis. Osmosis is a specific type of simple diffusion that refers specifically to water. And facilitated diffusion. This is one of our protagonists today. Facilitated diffusion utilizes proteins to help ions and other charged molecules pass through the membrane. However, it does not consume energy, and the molecules still flow down the concentration gradient. We also have active transport in contrast with passive. Active transport needs ATP to activate the proteins and conduct the transport. These are mainly conducted by pumps. There is also a special type of active transport called co-transport. Co-transport means that we have two things transported together. For example, we have hydrogen ions transported together with substance A. 
In this process, the hydrogen ion flows down its concentration gradient. However, substance A flows against its concentration gradient. This is a spontaneous process. However, it is still counted as a type of active transport. Why is that? That is because in order for this cold transport to happen, we first need to establish a concentration gradient of hydrogen. There may be some hydrogen pumps that pump hydrogen ions from one side to the other side to establish the concentration gradient. Then hydrogen ions can spontaneously flow back together with substance A. And that is why we actually need energy for this seemingly spontaneous process. And finally, we have bulk transport. These include endocytosis and exocytosis. Both are accomplished through vesicles. In endocytosis, a patch of the cellular membrane is pinched off into the cell to form a small vesicle. Then the vesicle will contain some of the substances that exist just out of the cell membrane. Exocytosis is just the opposite. A vesicle inside the cell merges with the cell membrane and vomits its content into the extracellular environment. These bulk transport also need energy, and they are accomplished by the synergy of many different proteins. We're going to go into details about exocytosis in the chapter of synaptic transmission. Let's take a look at the common characteristics of transmembrane proteins. How do they enable cross-membrane transport? Well, here is an example. This is not a protein that aids cross-membrane transport, but nevertheless, it is a transmembrane protein that goes through the plasmic membrane. This is actually a rhodopsin, a protein that senses light in our eyes. As we can see in this contour of the protein, the yellow parts are hydrophobic residues. As we know, proteins are made of a sequence of amino acids. There are 20 types of amino acids, and they have different properties. Some amino acids are nonpolar and thus hydrophobic, while some others are polar or charged and thus hydrophilic. As we can see in this figure of the protein, the yellow patches are hydrophobic and the blue patches are hydrophilic. There is a large area of hydrophobic patches in the section where the protein is inside the membrane. These interact with the hydrocarbon tails of the phospholipids and sticks the protein inside. The other parts which are hydrophilic interact with the water environment inside and outside the cell. This is why membrane proteins can span the membrane and help transport. Now let's move on to examine two specific types of cross-membrane transport, namely facilitated diffusion and active transport. In facilitated diffusion, one way is to use ion channels. We can see a potassium channel below in these figures. As we can see in the left figure, which is a top view of a potassium channel, there is a very small hole in the middle through which one potassium ion can pass through. As we can see more clearly on the right side, the hole is actually not just a hole, but a long tube, a long channel. The potassium can go all the way from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. Thus, the protein provides a tunnel, a channel, for the ion to diffuse. Ion channels have a very special property. They are selective. Selectivity means that the ion channel of a specific type of ion usually just allows one type of ion to pass through. In this figure, on both sides of the ion channel, we can see that there is an amino acid loop or chain that makes the channel narrow enough. These loops are called pore loops because they are just adjacent to the pores. Through these loops, we make sure that ions larger than the potassium ion cannot pass through the potassium channel. But how do we make sure that other ions smaller than potassium for example, sodium ions. How do we make sure they don't pass through the tunnel? Well, this relates to the property of a water shell. When ions flow around in water, they are charged. Therefore, the polar water molecules are attracted to them, and the water molecules form a shell around the sodium ion or potassium ion or whatever ion that is in water. When potassium ions pass through the tunnel, the surrounding water shell is peeled off because the channel is just wide enough for one potassium ion. However, 
when sodium ion, which is smaller, tries to go through the channel, its surrounding water is not able to peel off successfully. As a result, the sodium plus the water is actually larger than the potassium ion. Therefore, this makes the ion channel selective to potassium and exclusive to both larger and smaller ions. We also have another type of facilitated diffusion, that is through carrier proteins. Carrier proteins are somewhat different from ion channels. The function of ion channels is very intuitive. It creates a passage for the ions to go through. Carrier proteins, on the other hand, is somewhat a little bit abstract. It has an opening to one side of the membrane. Then if, for example, if an ion binds to a site on the protein, then the protein changes its conformation and opens to the other side, releasing the ion on the other side of the membrane. This is like the process of exiting a spacecraft. If an astronaut wants to exit the spacecraft, then he first goes into a specific chamber and then closes the door to the interior of the spacecraft. Then he opens the door to outer space and goes into the space through that chamber. This is how the carrier protein functions. But please note that carrier proteins do not use energy. They can carry the ions either way. So basically, the net flow of the ion is still from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. Active transport. Active transport is realized through ion pumps. For example, this is a sodium potassium pump, which will be very important when we talk about action potentials. The sodium potassium pump has several peculiar properties. First, it carries two types of ions instead of one single type of ion. Secondly, it usually pumps three sodium ions out and two potassium ions in. Note that three minus two is one. Therefore, there is a net change of one unit of charge on the size of the membrane. And that is an important characteristic of this sodium potassium pump. We also have other types of pumps, for example, the calcium pump, which will be important later. Question time. Why do you think proteins are so important in cross membrane transport? Please take some time to pause and think about it. Well, firstly, proteins allow passage of charged ions or polar particles through the hydrophobic center of the membrane. Also, proteins have selectivity. Moreover, proteins can transport particles against the concentration gradient using energy in the form of ATP. Moreover, proteins can be gated. What does gated mean? Well, gated ion channels are usually closed and they only open when they receive some kind of stimuli. There are voltage gated ion channels which only open when there is a certain voltage difference between the two sides of the membrane. We also have ligand gated ion channels which are gated by some chemical molecule. It is like a key. When it binds to a specific site on the ligand gated ion channel, the channel opens. On the other hand, we have light gated ion channels, channels gated by pressure, channels gated by temperature, etc. These will be important when we talk about sensory and perception. Now it's time to get to some chemistry. If you would like to skip this section, you can jump to the slide where there is a, an equation labeled the Nernst equation. So first, we know that in chemistry, there are some primary electrovoltaic cells. These cells were invented at first by Volta. These cells usually use two different types of metals and their respective ion solutions. Building them together would create a battery to create electricity. Thus, we can convert chemical energy into electric energy. There is a special type of electrovoltaic cell that is called the concentration cells. Concentration cells use one single type of metal. However, the concentration of the metal ion in the two electrodes are different, and that helps us create an electrical current. This is very similar to neuronal membranes. On the two sides of the neuronal membrane, we have the same types of ions, but at different concentrations. So we would like to describe this as a concentration cell. 
Let's start with some basic equations in chemistry. Firstly, delta G, the change in Gibbs free energy, is equal to delta G under a standard condition plus RT ln Q, where R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, and Q is the reaction quotient. We also have delta G equals minus NFE, where N is the charge of the metal ion, F is the Faraday constant, and E is the cell potential. Substituting the terms in the first equation with the second equation, we can get this. And then dividing both sides by minus NF, we can get this. This is already very close to our final desired form. Now we would like to substitute a few values. Firstly, the standard electro potential is zero because under the standard conditions, both electrodes should have ionic concentration at one mole per liter. Thus, there's no difference in concentration in the standard cell. So it has zero volts as its standard potential. We also have Q equals the concentration of ion in the left electrode over the concentration of the ion on the right electrode. Putting them in the equation, we can get the final equation for the concentration cell. By analogy, if we think that one side of the membrane is one electrode and the other side is the other electrode, we can get the Nernst equation, where we have the concentration of ions outside the cell over the concentration of ions inside the cell. What does the Nernst equation describe? Well, it describes the two forces that drive ions to move across the membrane. One of them is the force exerted by the concentration gradient. There is a tendency of, for the ions to flow from higher concentration to lower concentration. The other force is the electrostatic force. Particles of the same charge repel each other and particles of different charges attract each other, thus providing the second force for ions to move. The Nernst equation just describes the relationship between concentration and equilibrium potential. Now let's try to do some calculations based on the Nernst equation. The equation is given on the right. Please note that N equals the charge of the ion. It can be negative. For example, for chlorine, N equals minus one. For calcium, N equals positive. For calcium, N equals positive two. Another point that requires our attention is that the equilibrium potential here are given in microvolts. So we need a conversion of units. If you have a calculator or a phone or a computer, why not take some time and do some calculations? Here are the answers. First, we calculate the ratio of concentration out versus in. Potassium ion has equilibrium potential of around minus 80 microvolts. Sodium ions has around positive 62 microvolts. Calcium only has 0 0.0002 micromoles concentration inside. That is very, very small. And we will come upon this fact in synaptic transmission. And finally, chlorine has 13 micromoles inside the cell. In this episode, we talked about the different proteins that are useful in cross-membrane transport, especially ion channels and ion pumps. Then we deduced the Nernst equation and learned to calculate the equilibrium potential. In the next episode, we are first going to talk about the concentration gradients of specific ions. And then we are going to examine the multi-ion case of the Nernst equation. It is called the goldman hodgkin cotts equation. And finally, we can deduce the whole, the total resting membrane potential. And finally, discuss how to change the membrane potential experimentally. That's all for this episode. See you again.